Okay. We have four basic components of any air conditioning system. And again, when you look at this screen here, you'll be able to see that we have a compressor. Okay, the compressor's in the center. That's the heart of my air conditioning system. Okay, heart of the system is the compressor. Just do that. Oops, doesn't like that. Okay. Then we go to the evaporator. The evaporator, and we're going to spend a lot more time on this. This is just a first introduction. We go from the compressor, then we have an evaporator. And this is not necessarily in order how the system works. Okay, the evaporator is my indoor component. Okay, it's what absorbs the heat and collects the heat into the chemical that runs around through here called the refrigerant. We also have the third component. It's the metering device. If you, look, if you look between the filter dryer and the evaporator, there's a small area called a cap tube. That's just one type of metering device. Metering device is really simple. Think about your finger over the end of a garden hose. Okay? All it does is take a liquid and sprays it. And again, there's a reason for that, but it takes a liquid and sprays it. Okay, then my condenser is the fourth major component of my refrigeration cycle. Okay, condenser, it takes the heat that we've collected into the refrigerant from the inside and it puts it, on the, it puts it on the outside of the system or the building or whatever we're talking about. Okay? It takes the heat that we've collected and it puts it outside. So our four basic components of the refrigeration cycle okay, is my compressor, my condenser, my metering device, and my evaporator. Those are my four basic components. Okay, and those are the four components. You basically do need to, you need to remember those four basic components. Okay, it's a memorization thing on that. There's no other way to do it. Compressor, condenser, metering device, evaporator. So, if I take and draw, uh, if I took something real simple and I drew out my refrigeration cycle just on a blank piece of paper, Okay, I would have a big circle because this is a never-ending cycle. So I would have a big circle. On that big circle, I would have the four components. Okay. Sometimes so much easier to do this on a whiteboard. Okay. I'd have my four components. I'd have my compressor. Pull the... Make this a little bigger. Okay. I'd have my condenser. I'd have my metering device, and I'd have my evaporator. Okay, now, location of these components matter. The evaporator is inside. That's the part that we're blowing the air across. That's my inside component. My metering device is also inside in air conditioning again. We're strictly talking air conditioning. I know some of you guys have had refrigeration as well. We're talking air conditioning. My condenser is outside. And my compressor is outside. With me so far? Did I lose anybody yet?
Okay. Now, this always works in the same order. This line, my circle, is basically the path of refrigerant to flow. Okay. So when we look at refrigerant flow, we come out of the compressor and we go to the condenser. We come out of the condenser. We go to the metering device. Okay, we come out of the metering device. We go to the evaporator. We come out of the evaporator and we go to the compressor and we start the whole cycle over again. That should be red. So this is a never ending cycle. Refrigerant is a chemical that is designed specifically to, to collect heat, carry the heat, and reject the heat through a pressure change and through a temperature change. Again, refrigerant is a substance that is designed to collect heat, carry the heat, and then reject the heat in the outdoor environment. Questions so far? Okay. In the refrigeration cycle, we have pressure changes that go on through the entire cycle. Okay. We have pressure changes. I'm going to turn this on. Okay, and we'll turn the indoor temperature, oops, we'll turn the indoor temperature way up there. And I know it's tough to see, but if you can, if you're able to see here, you can see that the little dots have started moving. Okay, we have a number of areas of pressure change. From the compressor to the condenser, and all the way through the liquid line to the metering device. So in other words, from the compressor to the metering device, okay, is all high pressure. Okay, we have two sides of the system, high pressure and low pressure. From the compressor all the way through the condenser to the metering device is high pressure. From the metering device, which remember I said is like putting your finger over the end of a garden hose, okay, and spraying that liquid into more of a vapor or mist sort of pattern, from the metering device all the way back to the compressor is low pressure because again our metering device has dropped that pressure. Okay, so again, high pressure and low pressure is separated by the compressor and the metering device. So if I go back over here to my to my circular diagram, okay, we have a point of pressure change. The pressure change happens at the, at the um, compressor and the metering device. Everything on the condenser side, okay, is going to be high pressure. Okay, everything on the condenser side, high pressure. Okay, everything on the evaporator side, okay, is going to be low pressure. And I know you hate this word, but, it, but to learn this, there's no other way to learn this other than to memorize it. So again, we have a point of pressure change. It's my compressor and my metering device. So the compressor ups the pressure and the metering device lowers the pressure. 
Exactly. The compressor compresses, just like an air compressor does. The metering device acts like the end of a garden hose with a spray head or your finger on it. The outlet of that is going to be a lower pressure than what's in the hose. Make sense? Yep. Anybody else have a question on that? Because that is, again, I've covered another major point here. Okay. Uh Go ahead. Okay. Moving on. Part of the whole refrigeration cycle is that we actually absorb heat and we train and we reject heat. Now, what happens when you have a pot of water that you're boiling? Okay, what what happens when you're boiling water? What's happening with heat and the water? Um, the water evaporates through the heat. It's rising. Okay, is the water absorbing heat? Sort of. No. As it boils off. So if you have the pot on the stove and you have the stove turned on, does the water absorb heat for the temperature to go up? Yes. It conducts it. Yeah, the pot conducts the heat into the water. The water absorbs heat, and eventually as it boils, it's going to change state from a liquid to steam, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's exactly what's happening here in the evaporator. Okay, as I come out of the metering device, I'm coming into the cap tube, Okay, coming out of the cap tube, I now have that spray of liquid refrigerant. Again, think in your mind, equivalent to water. I have that spray of liquid refrigerant. It goes into the evaporator. And as it absorbs heat from the space I'm trying to cool, it actually boils off inside the tubes. This actually boils this refrigerant off inside the tubes and it changes into a gas, which is equivalent of steam. Okay, and it goes back to the compressor. So again, coming out of the cap tube, it's sort of a, we call it a flash gas. It's basically a low pressure, uh, sort of a spray of refrigerant. Okay, it's a combination of gas and um, liquid. Comes out of the cap tube, gets sprayed into the evaporator, where as it absorbs heat, it boils off, okay? And that steam or the vapor that this has turned into travels back to the compressor. Any time I boil a liquid and change it into gas, I go through what's called a change of state. So this is another very important term, change of state. I'm taking a liquid, and I'm taking it into a gas. I'm changing the state. Just like if I take a, li a gas and turn it into a liquid, there's a change of state. You have two types of heat. We have two types of heat we worry about. Okay, we have latent heat. And we have sensible heat. Does anybody remember or can anyone tell me what the difference is between the two senses, between the two um, types of heat? Latent and sensible. Yeah, between latent and sensible. What is, what, how can you explain latent and sensible to me in the easiest way possible? And again, I know there's people on the call who haven't had it. That's fine. But in the easiest way possible, how can you explain latent and sensible to me? Latent heat is uh, where the, the object, the water, is changing state but not temperature. And sensible heat is when it is changing temperature but not state. That's, that's probably... What about, can I measure latent heat? 
Uh, only uh, I wrote it down. <laughs> Sorry. Can I can I measure a latent heat change lo like with a thermometer? Um, and, yes. and, and anybody can jump in here. No. Yes. I cannot measure latent heat change with a thermometer. No. But there is <clears throat> there is a chart that is available of uh, latent heat of common substances that you can refer to. Yup. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I'm not. Yeah, definitely agree on that. There's charts available. I'm so glad you said that because yeah, eventually you'll be using those charts. But um, for the purposes that we have, you cannot measure latent heat. Okay, you can refer to charts, but I can't use a thermometer and just say, this is what my latent heat is. This is how many BTUs I'm absorbing or giving off. Now, sensible heat, can I measure it? Yes, because yes. there's an yes. obvious temperature yes. rise or drop. Okay, yeah, I can measure sensible heat. Okay. Okay, just with the thermometer on the wall. Is there a change of state that happens with sensible heat? No. No, because the minute I go, the minute I have a change of state, it's latent heat. Okay, what you may not know, because I don't think we've ever talked about it, is does everybody remember what a BTU is? We talked about it a little bit yesterday. What's a BTU? British thermal unit. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's a British thermal unit. But what is one BTU? What's the definition of one BTU? It's like it's oil or gas or something like that. One ton of cooling. Nah, one ton of cooling is twelve. Is it's it's heating it's one pound of water. Heats, yeah. It's heating one pound of water or cooling, one degree Fahrenheit. Okay, so that's sensible heat. Okay, but when we go through a latent heat change, we basically do the same thing. Let me draw a little line here. Okay, so I have my, I have my refrigerant or water or whatever it is. Okay, let's just stick with water for the minute. Okay, what temperature does water boil at? 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so if I come up to 212, okay, water starts to boil. It's not a steam yet. It's still liquid. Okay, then I go through my latent heat change. And then I might be at my steam, I might have 300 degree steam. That's possible. Matter of fact, we do it with heating all the time. Okay? In this flat area here, I don't have a temperature change. All I have is a change of state. Okay? However, this change of state absorbs a lot of BTUs. Here, I'm just raising my temperature. One, one BTU is one pound of water, one degree. To take one pound of water from a, from a liquid to a gas takes more than 100 BTUs per pound. So anytime I do a change of state, I'm absorbing a ton of heat because we measure heat in BTUs. So in two sections of my refrigeration system, which is why I'm going through this, I am absorbing and discharging BTUs, okay, in my evaporator. And if you look closely at these lines, in my evaporator, I'm coming out of the cap tube as a sort of a liquid vape, sort of a sprayed liquid. I start absorbing... BTUs, I raise the temperature of the refrigerant to its boiling point. And then I do a change of state in the center of this evaporator. I'm changing from the liquid 
to a vapor. I'm absorbing a lot of heat. Okay? Then that refrigerant is now a gas. I'm going back to the compressor. Again, I'm coming out of the metering device as a low pressure liquid. Okay, I'm now absorbing heat, first sensible heat, and then latent heat as I do a change of state into a gas. I'm going back to the compressor as a gas. So I'm absorbing a bit of sensible heat. I'm absorbing a ton of latent heat. There's a lot of heat being absorbed as we go through this change of state. And then I still absorb a little bit more sensible heat as I go back to the compressor. But nothing, I mean, it's important, but we're not going to worry about that for right now. But what I'm trying to get across is where I'm absorbing this heat, because this is in the inside. This is the area that I'm blowing air across to cool the air. Okay? Questions on that? I know people have questions, so ask the questions. Other people probably have the same question. Okay, again, metering device. Comes in as a low-pressure liquid. Starts heating up, sensible heat. Comes into the center of my evaporator, acts like that pot of water on the stove. Gets up to a certain temperature. It starts going through a change of state. It absorbs a lot of heat, a lot of BTUs, till it's eventually a gas or a complete vapor. Comes out of the evaporator and heads back to my compressor. That is what is going on right here in this side of the system. Okay, so as I'm, as I'm looking at this diagram, I'm doing a change of state right there. Okay? Doing a change of state right there. From the metering device to about the center of the evaporator is a liquid. From the center of the evaporator back to the compressor is a gas. Questions on that side of the system. So where is the cooling taking place at? Like what's cooling, what is causing the, the air to cool? As I'm blowing the air across this evaporator, which is a metal thing. Think about it like the pot on the stove. Okay? As I'm blowing the air across this evaporator, it is actually the refrigerant in here is pulling that heat through that metal by conduction, and as it absorbs the heat, the air coming out the other side is cool. Mm. Okay, so again, I'm blowing warm air across here as this refrigerant that's in there absorbs the heat. A lack of heat is cool, right? Yep. Uh... A lack of heat is cool. Okay, so when I've pulled, when I've absorbed the heat into that refrigerant and boiled it off, the air that's coming out of here has less heat in it. That's so. The is the is the coolant going through the evaporator in a it's in a it's in a, a gas state evaporated state? Is it hot or is it cold? It's still going to feel cold to your touch because the boiling point, which we haven't talked about this yet, the temperature that this refrigerant boils off at is very low. Okay, mm. where water boils at 212 degrees, okay, the temperature of this chemical where it boils off could be at 32 degrees. Okay, it's not water. So... I'm boiling this temperature at a very low at a very low temperature for substance boiling. And we'll get into that in a minute. Does that answer your question? It does indeed. Okay. 
So again, on the evaporator side of the system, this is my cold side of the system, I have a change of state from a liquid to a gas. Now, thinking back to high school science class, for those of you who stayed awake through it, and for those who did it, we'll catch you up. Okay, thinking back to high school science class, what happens when you compress a gas? It turns back into a liquid. Yeah, because I'm raising the pressure, which basically raises the boiling point or changes the boiling point, right? And it changes back, it raises the boiling point, so if, I, if over here, if my, my substance was gas, I raise the pressure in the compressor, and eventually I raise the pressure enough, it turns back into a liquid. Okay? Or, in the case of a compressor, I'm not changing it here into a liquid yet, Okay, I'm just raising the pressure of the gas. So I might be coming in with a pressure of 60 PSI, and I'm coming out with a pressure of could be 200 PSI. So I'm raising the temperature or raising the pressure of this gas. When I raise the pressure of any substance, what does that do to the boiling point? Increases the boiling point. Increases the boiling point. So then, now I'm outside, okay, where my outdoor temperature could be 90, 95 degrees. I'm coming out with the refrigerant that has a much higher boiling point now and I'm blowing outside air across it. So I'm getting rid of the heat because now my temperature of this refrigerant through the whole compression cycle is higher than the outside temperature. Okay, with me so far? My compressor is increasing the pressure, increases the boiling point, and just through heat of compression, think about an air compressor. That air coming out is warm, so I'm increasing the temperature. Anytime I push molecules of something together, I increase the temperature. I'm coming out of here with a high temperature, high pressure gas. I come into the condenser, which is the big coil you see outside. That's the outside part of the air conditioning. I'm now pushing that high pressure, high temperature gas into a coil, and I'm blowing air across it. So I'm lowering the temperature because the air coming across it is about 35 degrees lower than the temperature of the refrigerant that's in the coil. So if I have a refrigerant that's higher temperature, with air being blown across it that's a lower temperature, where's the heat going to go? Now, it's going to leave the refrigerant, right? It's going to go into the outside air. So as I lower this temperature, this high-pressure refrigerant, what's it going to do in this? This gas is coming out of here as a gas. I'm now lowering the temperature, this high-pressure refrigerant. What's it going to do? Condense. It's going to condense into a liquid. comes out of the condenser as a liquid comes back through the liquid line comes back to the cap tube we start our cycle all over again so coming back to my circle drawing okay I have another point of change of state here Okay, I'm coming out of the compressor as a gas. I'm coming into my condenser by just the air blowing across it. And I'm coming back into a liquid.
That is the four segments of the refrigeration cycle. So let me ask you my commonly asked questions. Hint. My most commonly asked questions. Where's my two points of pressure change? At the metering device and the compressor. Yep, compressor and metering device. Where's my, where's my change of state? At the condenser and the evaporator. Yep, center of the condenser, center of the evaporator. Okay, what side, what major component is on the low pressure side? Evaporator. What major component is on the high pressure side? Condenser. What's my four major components of the refrigeration cycle? Rear, compressor, condenser, cooling device, evaporator. Okay, gentlemen, and anybody else who's on the call, um, if you're taking screen prints, if you're taking pictures, if you've got anything in there, I have a ton of background noise, but if you're jotting anything down, if you're taking pictures, if you're memorizing this stuff, if you want study material, this is a page I would probably save. I'll give you a minute to do that. Yeah, who's ripping a bong right now? This is what your entire rest of your career, other than electrical, is built on. This diagram right here. So the compressor is really the heart of the whole system. Without that, I mean, that's the most important part. The compressor is the heart of the refrigeration system. And that, by the way, if I remember right, is a final exam question. The compressor is the heart of the refrigeration system. Now, there's one other device that this whole thing would not work with. What that, what's that device? The metering device. Yeah. I cannot have a refrigeration system without having both components. i got to have the metering device. If I don't change that pressure, if I just have high pressure going forward, I'm never going to change my boiling points. So is it safe to say that the most uh, common component to go bad is the compressor and the metering device. Those are the two that would go, that are put under the most stress. Well, you know, let me, let me answer that with something that I saw a couple years ago. I went to an in-house training session at Carrier. Um, because I'm a, I'm a factory tech for them as well in my spare time. I do a lot of work for them doing high-end troubleshooting for them. I went, to a, I went to their factory training session, and I saw this little iceberg sitting on a counter. Okay, it would look like a little igloo, and it just sat there. And it's, it was there day after day, just sort of the same thing. And I finally asked the instructor what that little igloo was. And it was total ice. It was it was about a foot tall, about a foot and a half wide, and it was just an ice blob that was sitting there. He said that he said that compressor has been running there for 15 years. I said, okay, why? He said because that compressor was diagnosed as bad by a technician under warranty, and it was returned to us as a bad compressor. And there was nothing wrong with the compressor. I think to answer your question, a compressor is the most oftenly misdiagnosed component of the refrigeration system. Your most, your biggest failure is actually the metering device getting clogged because of improper installation. Okay, if the piping isn't done right. If 
care isn't taken not to get dirt in there. Okay, the metering device will actually clog up, and you'll see why when we talk more about metering devices. But our most often misdiagnosed component is that compressor. Is is the the cooling liquid caustic? It is dangerous. It's not. I don't want to say it's a total liquid because that all depends on pressure. Okay, so it's a it's it is dangerous. Okay, it will displace oxygen. It will not like cause chemical burns, but if it gets onto your skin, it will cause frost burns. Okay, thus my comment about safety glasses a few days ago. Okay, if when it comes out of the jug, okay, when you let refrigerant out of a jug, it comes out, depending on how you're holding the can, as either a vapor or a liquid. Okay, when you spray it out of the jug, okay, as a liquid, whatever it touches, it absorbs all the heat from. Okay, and when it absorbs all the heat, what's the, what's, what is, what happens to something with that all the heat is absorbed out of? It turns into a gas. Well, no, whatever I'm pulling the heat out of gets it cold. It gets ice right? over. It's cold. Okay, so, for example, one of the refrigerants we use is R410A. Okay, if I go to my trusty refrigeration chart, let's see if I can pull one up here. Okay, if I look at R410A, and again, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, so please don't panic if you don't understand what I'm looking at, because I am really getting ahead of where I want it to be. Okay, refrigerants come in different classifications, okay? R410A at room temperature, and I'm just trying to find my chart. Um... At room, at room pressure, okay, R410A like boils at like a negative 60 degrees or something like that. I'm not finding my chart real handy here, but um, R410A boils at a, at a very low temperature at atmospheric pressure. Okay, so do I want my hand that that liquid refrigerant flows onto to be at a negative 60 degrees Fahrenheit? No. Probably a bad thing, right? So yeah. it's not caustic, but it will cause major frost burns. Okay, I know of two technicians who are disabled because of this. Okay, just to give you an idea, R22, which is another type of refrigerant, Okay, when it's at 60 PSI, it boils at 32 degrees, or sorry, yeah, 32 degrees is roughly right around there. For those of you who have gauges already, you can look at the face of the gauge and you can tell what the boiling temperature refrigerant is. Okay, by looking at what the, what the gauge says at zero. If you look at your low side gauge and look at zero, you can actually see what your boiling temperature of refrigerant is. So back to our refrigeration cycle, okay? What was going on in the entire refrigeration cycle, okay, I'm coming out of the compressor as a high temperature, okay? Gas or a high temperature, high pressure gas. Change that to red. I'm coming through my condenser where I'm first lowering the sensible heat down to the boiling temperature, boiling point of that refrigerant or the condensing point. I'm then going through a change of state, okay, where I'm doing a latent heat. Then I'm losing a little bit more sensible heat as it flows to the metering device. Okay? Then once I am in the metering device, 
I'm coming out of the metering device. I'm losing more sensible heat. Okay, then I'm doing a change of state, which doesn't have any heat loss. Actually, that's this line here. We're going to go the other direction on because I'm gaining heat. Okay, then I'm doing my change of state. Remember, I'm boiling off that refrigerant. And then I'm gaining a little bit more heat on my way back to the compressor. Sensible heat. So I'm doing two latent heat changes. Okay, I'm doing a latent heat here in the condenser and I'm doing a latent heat change here in my evaporator and this cycle never ends okay that that whole cycle never ends so having said that can refrigerant ever be used up no no. Does refrigerant ever get destroyed under normal operation? No. 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 So if somebody goes out to a house, and you guys may have heard this on and off from friends or family, if somebody goes out to a house and says, oh, we have to, we have to charge, we have to put Freon into your system, we, we, you've used up your refrigerant. We have to replace it. What can you tell me about that technician? Liar. He's a liar. The only time refrigerant comes out of a system is if there's a leak. Why does this matter in the grand scheme of things? Okay, quite honestly, it's because of cost and, and environmental. R22, the last jug of R22, which is 35 pounds of refrigerant in a jug, I paid $682 for. That's at wholesale. Okay, R22 is going away. It's no longer being produced. The last time I purchased a jug at wholesale pricing of 410A, which is the replacement refrigerant. I know those numbers mean nothing right now. They will. Don't worry about it. Okay, the last time I jug, placed a jug of that for the 35-pound cylinder, it was 385 Now, if I am buying it at 385 for 35 pounds, okay, am I selling it to the customer for the same? In like 500 No. Oh, hell no. Okay. Uh, if I take 35 pounds, if I take my 385 and divide it by 35, that's about $11 my purchase cost. I sell a pound of refrigerant to the customer at $125. Yeah. So why is it not, why is it uh, bad for some systems? Let's say, for example, a system ran on R12, and they say that you're not supposed to, like, that. they don't make that anymore. So, so you would put the modern equivalent in, in, but that's not good for certain systems. Why do they say that? Because there's two things that are in a refrigeration, and again, we're going to cover this more. So if I'm losing people, please just know I'm going to cover this more. There's two major things here that are dependent on refrigerant. The metering device, the size of the opening in that metering device, has a lot to do with refrigerant, the refrigerant chemical makeup, the molecular makeup. The other thing that has to do with it is the compressor, the compressor specifically designed for certain refrigerants. There's also oil in this system. The new modern refrigerants cannot use mineral oil. It has to be a synthetic oil, okay? And the older compressors can't handle the synthetic oil. So there's two things that are going on with the refrigerant that you can't use the wrong refrigerant in the system. 
It's the metering device and the compressor. So what would the so, – so let's say you did put a, uh, a synthetic into something that took a mineral spirit oil. What, what would fail first? Would that – the metering device, would that clog? Oh no, the compressor would because it's gonna all the all the seals, okay, the mm. gaskets and stuff that are in the compressor, those are gonna break down. So is there any other reason that refrigerant would need to be replaced other than a leak? Yeah, if you have a compressor that burns down and again we haven't talked about motors yet, so again I'm getting a little bit out of where I where I really need to be right now. But the, the motor, the compressor motor has windings, okay? Because remember, any motor is basically a coil of wire with a magnet inside of it, okay? Those windings are directly immersed in the refrigerant. If you take a look at a compressor, and I'll, t I'll get some pictures and stuff and try to show you. If you take a look at a compressor, okay, that, that motor is directly in contact with the refrigerant and the oil. Matter of fact, refrigerant is what cools the compressor. That's what provides the cooling for the compressor, the refrigerant going across the motor windings. If there is moisture in the system, okay, if there's ever moisture in here, and that's always from a technician's fault, okay, that moisture gets in a system. If there's moisture in that system, the refrigerant and the oil and the moisture break down to cause acid. Okay, those motor windings will start to break down. If you can catch it in time, you can change the refrigerant in the system, flush it out, and put new refrigerant in that doesn't have any moisture, and we can save a compressor. That's the only time you need to change out refrigerant. if there's acid in the system. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Any other questions on the refrigeration cycle? Any other things you're wondering about? And again, we still have a long way to go before this makes 100% sense. So again, if you don't get it the first time, don't panic, but I need you to start memorizing this chart. It's going to make a lot it's going to help you understand everything else we talk about. Because even as we start going through electrical, I want you to keep in mind this is the reason why we are using the motors. This is the reason why we use a blower to blow air across the evaporator. This is the reason why I use a condenser fan to blow air across the condenser. Okay. This is the reason why I have to have a compressor. We haven't talked about the different refrigerants yet. I'm going to start talking about them tomorrow. But we haven't, but I need you to understand, this is what our end goal is, to put everything together. Any questions on this? The only other okay. question I would have is on the low pressure end of things, uh, if the fan was to fail on the low pressure end of things, how would that affect the, the cycle? Okay, if the fan is to fail, let me probably help. Can you guys, when I pull up the simulator, can you see that well enough? When I pull this up, are you able to see the diagram well enough that shows up? Yep. Okay. Yes. So if the fan fails here, okay, and I'm not blowing any hot air, any warm air across the evaporator, okay, what's eventually going to happen to that evaporator temperature? It's going to freeze up. It's going to freeze up, okay, because if I'm not blowing warm air across it and the refrigerant is designed to absorb a certain amount of heat, that evaporator is going to eventually freeze up. It's going to continue getting colder and colder and colder. So you're going to have an iceberg there. 
okay, that ice will eventually spread all the way down to the suction line. Now, there's one thing about, an I about ice, and ice is a really, really good insulator. Okay, ice is a great insulator. It will actually insulate this suction line. So eventually, we're going to get to the point where the liquid being sprayed in this cap tube into the evaporator does not have enough heat to boil all that liquid off. It's going to come back to the compressor as a liquid. And now this is a concept you're going to hear me say again. The compressor is a vapor pump. We cannot compress liquids. Think about hydraulics for those of you who've worked with hydraulics before. We cannot compress a liquid. If I put pressure on a liquid, the liquid is going to try to go someplace. It's going to try to push someplace. Okay, when I compress a liquid, it creates a lot of force. So this liquid gets into this compressor. It's going to destroy the pistons and the valves that are in this compressor. It's going to break the compressor. So if this fan stops running, okay, we're going to eventually get ice. If no one catches it, that compressor will get liquid in it. Okay, and that liquid's going to destroy that compressor. We never want liquid in a compressor. And, and what would the effect if the fan died on the on the uh, condenser side? If the fan dies on the condenser side, we have our hot gas that's a very high pressure hot gas that we're expecting eventually for it to cool down. Remember, we have temperature that's cooling here that's coming out of what's labeled the discharge line because I don't think you can see my mouse. We're coming out of the discharge line. We're coming into the top of the condenser. We're cooling that off a little bit in that first row of condenser so we can do our latent heat change. If the fan is not running, we're not going to be blowing enough air across this to start cooling that refrigerant to do its latent heat change. So eventually, the temperature will continue to rise all the way through the system. Okay, As the temperature rises, the pressure rises. Okay, as the pressure rises, our boiling point goes up here, so we're not going to, we're basically not going to boil off that refrigerant well enough. And again, this whole idea is the temperatures are going to continue to go up. As we are eventually, if we're lucky, we're going to turn off a high pressure switch here that's on the discharge line that protects the whole system. If there's no high pressure switch, there's an internal pressure relief in this compressor that should blow. It should start bypassing the compressor with the hot gas. If we're unlucky and none of that works, eventually a braze or solder joint on this condenser is going to pop and you're going to lose all the refrigerant outside. But most systems have high pressure controls because we don't want 800 PSI of pressure in the condenser. So a condenser fan going out is your symptoms you see when you get on a job site is going to be higher than normal pressures, improper cooling, and most likely a high pressure switch open. Does that answer your question on that side? It sure does. Okay, now how can you get around it? Let's let's just throw you in a service truck for a moment, and anybody can chime in here. If that condenser fan goes out on a Thanksgiving day, um, basically Thanksgiving day. Well, no, let's not say Thanksgiving day. Let's say July fourth. That condenser fan goes out. Okay, condenser fan goes out on July fourth. It's ninety-five degrees outside, eighty-five percent humidity. Okay. You need to get some cooling for the customer. What can you do? You don't have a fan on your truck. What do you do? Dries. What was that? Take the fan from the from the evaporator side and switch it to the condenser side. 
Ed, uh, not the same fan. The blower motor, you'll see it's different, totally different fans. Think out, the, think out of the box. Isn't our whole purpose to cool this condenser? Some dry ice. Ed, dry ice is a possibility, but there's some effects of dry ice. What is the, when dry ice vaporizes, what's put off? Liquid nitrogen. It, it uh, creates a lot of carbon. No, uh, dioxide or some shit like that, and you could die from that. Yeah, it's it's not something that I really want to have. It's not something that I really want to put a lot of any place. I have seen people strap a box fan to the top of condensers for a temporary fix while they're waiting on a fan. What are your thoughts on that? You know what? To get a customer cooling, I'll do just about anything to keep a customer happy, so I've seen that done. I I don't like it, but, again, if it works, it works. What else can you use? Again, think out of the box. Water. And that's where I was going. Mm. You can actually put a, a water sprinkler next to the condenser, so it's not in the electrical compartment side of it, but you can actually put a sprinkler with a low spray of water next to that condenser as long as it drains off properly. And you can let that sprinkler run and you just tell the customer, hey, I have an option here. I can get you cooling, but it's going to use some water, okay? Or I can get you cooling, it's going to use a box fan. But you could put a little bit of water on that condenser, and believe it or not, it will actually, on a very low stream of water being sprayed on the side of the condenser, it will work perfectly. Okay, so all of this type of stuff is stuff I want you to be thinking about as we're going through this because our end goal is you need to be able to fix this stuff and help customers out when you get in the field. So let me ask you this question. So wh why is it plausible, and if so, why don't they, why wouldn't you, uh, depending on the system, just eliminate the fan on the condenser side and Put that submerged in some sort of antifreeze. Like well, submerged. we do something. We actually do something similar with that when we start talking about commercial systems and cooling towers. That's exactly what we do. Uh, all right. It sure is. I used to work on cooling towers. Yeah. How nasty was that? By the time the year was over. <laughs> it was a mess. We put you in your Tyvek suit, otherwise known as a body condom, and we send you in there to clean it. It's the job of the apprentice. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that's exactly what we do in com big commercial systems. But for a residence, it doesn't make sense. Any other questions on anything I've gone over today? I covered a lot on the refrigeration cycle. I really want you guys to, those of you who, um, don't worry about the simulator now. I was just doing it more for show and tell. If you want to pop around in there, someone put in there that their Simutech doesn't give an option to sign on. Should be under files, okay, and you should be able to get a user log on. I'm not telling anybody right now that they need to go do this, okay, under no circumstances, okay. But you are welcome if you want to pop around in there. You're more than welcome to go around and look around at it. You can't hurt it, okay. You can't hurt it. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you you told like as a so, uh, the two technician became a disable. You know what's the reason that uh, that makes the disable for them? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you were saying. So I'm saying like as a your uh, two technician two technician became a disable of of the like as a some uh, current or something. So I want to know like as a I mean what's their mistake that makes them disable? Oh, two te technicians became disabled from refrigerant. Yeah. Um, they. Whenever you have a refrigerant leak, you can't do anything, okay? You just have to let the refrigerant leak out. And, again, your shop instructor, when we get back on campus, is going to talk to you about this. But when you have a refrigerant leak, okay, if you pull a wrong fitting apart, if you have a leak in a system, you the only thing you can do is step back and watch the refrigerant come out. You cannot do anything. It's unsafe to do anything. These technicians tried to seal the leak while the refrigerant was coming out, and they burnt their hand. They basically got frostbite so badly on their hands they lost part of their hand. Oh, so we have to make uh, the refrigerant and make a dry and wait. 
No, you don't. You don't do it. If you have a refrigerant leak out of mm -hmm. a system, you don't do anything with it. You let it leak out. Oh, okay. You don't try to stop the leak when there's refrigerant leaking out of the system. You step back and you just let it leak. Because once there's a refrigerant leak, it becomes a hazardous situation for you to work in. These guys were trying to be a hero, and they both got hurt on the same job site. Okay, there was a, it was a rooftop unit that had over 400 pounds of refrigerant in the system. And they had an inch and a half line, inch and a half copper line that their fitting wasn't tight enough on. They tried getting in there with a pipe wrench and tried to tighten the fitting while liquid refrigerant was spraying out. Okay? It was absolutely, they tried to do the right thing, but they did not think back to their training that said, you cannot do anything in that situation. Okay. Is it even possible to add refrigerant to, to add more refrigerant to a system that is like that you had a leak and somehow you got the leak to stop and but you, I mean the system's still charged with refrigerant. Can you add? Can you still add more, or does it have to completely purge? Depends, depends on the type of refrigerant, and we're going to talk more about that when we talk about the refrigerants. Okay, it depends on actually the chemical makeup of the refrigerant. And I think I want to leave it at that for the moment, if that's okay. Oh, yeah. I, I'll go down a road that we don't want to go down right now. <laughs> I don't have enough time. Any other questions? <laughs> Guys, you have to memorize this chart. Okay. You have to memorize this. Okay, and that's all I have for today. So you guys Thank have you. a great afternoon. Thank you. Have and, I do that. Uh, if you need extra help, Hi. email me. Have a good day. Sure. Have a good day. Have a good day. All right. Okay. Thanks, Thanks, sir. Sir. Later. All right.